Welcome to the Four Eyes Podcast, brought to you by Young OD Connect. We give you a clear view into the new grad optometry world across Canada and the U.S. We are your hosts. I'm Dr. Deepan Kar. And I'm Dr. Amrit Bilku. And today we have Dr. Allison Bozung joining us on the podcast to talk about the most important thing that most of us forget to think about when becoming a doctor, mm -hmm. juggling your real life with your work life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so Dr. Bozung is an optometrist who graduated from SEO and she's currently working at Baskin Palmer in Miami and she's managing the hospital's 24 seven ophthalmic emergency department. And she's the residency program coordinator, which is awesome. And in her oh so little spare time, she's also serving the editorial board for review of optometry. She presents at conferences and she is a founding member of Young OD Connect. And recently, Allison had her first child and she's now trying to navigate this new world of having to allocate more time for her family while continuing to do the things that she loves in optometry. So, you know, this topic relates to probably so many new grad and young ODs, including ourselves, who mm -hmm. have finally entered their careers after you know, dedicating years of just focusing on optometry, focusing on graduating, focusing on getting a job. And we didn't actually realize that family time was put on the back burner. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really looking forward to chatting with Allison and hearing her story. And hopefully just her experience resonates with you, whether you are family planning as a mom or a dad or just wanting to spend more time with your family members and how you can kind of navigate your career to make more time for them. So without further ado, let's get into the conversation. So yeah, Allison, this is your first time on our podcast. Welcome. We're really excited to have you on. And so for our listeners, do you mind just telling them a little bit about yourself and what brought you to where you are today? For sure. Well, thanks for having me on the podcast. Super happy to be invited. Um, you know, basically I, uh, graduated in 2015 from Southern college of optometry in Memphis, Tennessee. After that, I did a one year disease residency, um, in ocular disease at, uh, Bascom Palmer in Miami, Florida. I ended up, um, leaving Florida and taking a job at the university of Iowa and worked in their department of ophthalmology for about three years before I actually transitioned back to Miami. So I'm back at Bascom Palmer now. Um, and I moved back because my now husband at the time we were doing long distance, we got engaged, we were apart for three years and then one of us had to move. We always joked, it'd be nice to be in the same time zone. Uh, yes. and so I was the one that came back, um, down here. So I practice at, uh, at Baskin Palmer, part of the university of Miami, and currently am the residency director for the optometry residency. Uh, work in the emergency department most of the time, have a few clinic days a month as well, and do some telehealth. So a few different things wow. all wrapped up, all wrapped up in one. They keep you busy there. Yeah, they do. <laughs> it's Palmer is like one of the, I believe it's like one of the top residencies or yes. a lot of, you know, optometry students want to get into that specific program. Yes. How has, what, how was your residency in that program? Like, <laughs> I mean, fantastic. I, I yeah. <laughs> only really know what you did right you can't really compare it to what you didn't do mm -hmm. um, there are so many fantastic residencies out there especially in ocular disease I interviewed at a lot of different ones um so it's really about the fit more than saying hey we're the best residency around because I really don't think that's true you know I think mm -hmm. that there are lots of great ones we mm -hmm. have to be the best one for some people mm -hmm. um but it was really it was fun it's I mean it's fast-paced it's a ton of disease. You see things you've never seen before. You learn kind of the nuances of common disease, as well as, you know, the pathway and diagnose uh, pathway and leading to a diagnosis for these kind of rare things and mm -hmm. what you have to rule in or out. Um, and then also the, the best thing is, you know, my, at the time residency director was Mark Dunbar. And he said, really, you know, it's a year of sitting at the feet of the experts, which I thought was yeah. a fantastic way of putting it because you really are right there seeing patients alongside the people that write you know, textbook chapters for the rest yes. of the world to learn from. And so that was a really appealing thing to me. And it was a great year. 
And mm-hmm. just, a, just one more question. I mean, we're talking about your residency now. Which I know. Is, we should have just <laughs> done a whole nother episode on that. We need to do yeah, another yeah. episode on your residency. Yeah. Um, just a question. Like, was your residency um, also kind of side by side with ophthalmology residency students? And if so, what was just your general experience um, with working with ophthalmology side by side, if you did? Yeah, for sure. So definitely we work side by side. Um, Most of the time our optometry residents work sort of alongside the fellows, actually, the ophthalmology fellows. So they'll be in, you know, a cornea clinic with that cornea um, attending. And then there's a cornea fellow who's there and then also our optometry resident. And so they're seeing patients side by side. Um, Really, I mean, the environment's super collaborative. I thought one thing was really interesting to me that a lot of the fellows come from programs that, you know, may or may not be as familiar with optometry in general. And so we would, some of the times where even our residents now, they're like, yeah, this, you know, fellows never worked with an optometrist before. And they thought we just did, you know, glasses. Mm -hmm. They don't know that we're here, you know, in the clinic, seeing disease, managing Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, And it really is a, a super, I think, super way to build those links and kind of bridges between ophthalmology and optometry in a training facility. Um, yeah. So it is, it is pretty cool. And, you know, my experience was good. I actually ended up dating one of the ophthalmology residents during his <laughs> first year. And he's now my husband. So <laughs> <laughs> I was going to be like, yeah, Ooh, right. tell us this story too. Now, how did that happen? <laughs> That's a, another story for another a little great <laughs> anatomy romance in Miami. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, okay, before we get too distracted here, <laughs> let's get back on topic. <laughs> yeah. Um, this will be for another episode, but so uh let's get right into it. So in the early days of your career, was family planning a priority in your mind? And if not, what changed your mindset? Entering my career, family planning was really not probably anywhere on my radar. And that's Mm -hmm. mostly because the state of life that I was in at that point, I was, you know, dating, but not engaged, not married, and I, you know, just moved to a new state that I'd never lived in before um, by myself. So not really at that point in time was I kind of thinking down that road. I was very more career oriented at that point. Mm -hmm. And then what made you, you kind of change your mind or when did you make that decision to start trying to build a family what did you do to take any proactive steps at work to prepare for future changes? Yeah. So I think that's a great question. Um, For me, it was mostly, you know, I, like I said, before I moved back to Miami, um, was, you know, married, you know, living with my husband, which was a great time to have a kid when you're not in different, you know, states. Yeah. So essentially for me, I was kind of like, well, you know, when is the right time? And I think that's a question that pops up for a lot of people. When is a good time to start a family? You know, and it, there's not really a perfect time. There never will be. You're always going to have other things going on in your life. And so it becomes more of a, you know, do you want a family? And for me, it was kind of, yes, you know, I want, you know, a kid, I want a family. And it was more so why not now instead of, Mm -hmm. oh, let me just wait till I have all my ducks in a row. Let me wait till, you know, everything's perfect because it never will be. Yeah. Um, and so the other thing to keep in mind is you never know how long it'll take actually to get pregnant. And mm-hmm. so I have a lot of friends, um, people that I know who've, you know, struggled for years to, to get pregnant. And I was like, you know, that could be us. That might be that journey that we walk down, um, mm-hmm. or it might not be. And so for me, I thought it was important once we were like, okay, we're ready. You know, we wouldn't be upset about it. If it happened now, we'll just start, you know, trying and, and seeing what happens. I didn't even think about that, like when to start trying, because you don't know how long that part's going to take or how, I guess, if you will even become pregnant. So that is a huge point people Mm -hmm. need to take into consideration when they're planning. Yeah. The number of miscarriages that people can Mm -hmm. have on average, you really want to think, take those things into consideration because it's real. It could happen to any of us at any time, multiple times. Something that you said, Allison. I think that determines the perfect time to have kids is if it happens, you're not mad about it. <laughs> that, so if oh, you sit yeah, there and be, say, I won't be mad if like, this happens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What I will say is that one thing we tried to do sort of leading up to the possibility of becoming pregnant was lots of trips. And so, you know, that's always yes. been important to us is traveling. And so we're like, Hey, let's go to, you know, 
a hop. We're like so close to different islands in the Caribbean. We can just go yeah. for a weekend. Um, let's go to, you know, different places we've been wanting to go. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we started traveling, went to Italy, we went oh, nice. to Patagonia and did, you know, this crazy oh. trip. So harder to do when you're pregnant, obviously, yeah. Uh, yeah. Not impossible, but difficult. And so we're just basically like planning all these trips and we're like, okay, at some point we're going to maybe have to tone down a little bit, but yeah. we, uh, we did a lot of that first too. And then continue those trips when your kid is like two years old and then take, yeah. take them on the little plane. <laughs> two years. <laughs> Not two years. So we actually went to Japan when I was yeah. four months pregnant. So, oh, Ooh. and she already has her passport. My, my, uh, our baby is nice. two months old. <laughs> so she's got her passport. She's going to be a travel baby in a little travel backpack city in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, like, there's a lot of factors dependent on this like if your pregnancy is even going well like if it if you're handling it well all these different mm -hmm. things but yeah nothing should you know hold you back in general yeah um yeah. but uh now like to get to the I think the more juicy part that everyone's a little bit more interested in so your mat leave really the question about that so mm -hmm. what maternity coverage was provided for you um, if any, and is maternity leave given through work or federal support? And is there a difference for independent contractors versus employed optometrists? Yeah, so all really great questions. And I think I could probably speak to at least some of the US listeners. Maybe I don't know the difference, whether it's like in Canada, you guys would definitely know that more than me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But essentially, you know, in the US, your employer uh, should give you um, it's federally mandated that you get 12 weeks of unpaid. So that's FMLA, unpaid leave. So basically all it means is that you get those 12 weeks, you are guaranteed to get your, your job back when you come back. So they can't fire you. That's all it means. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it doesn't mean that you get paid. It doesn't mean that, you know, you get any additional benefits besides healthcare, which you obviously maintain because you've maintained your job. Um, and it is different depending on the type of work. So if you're what we call like a 1099 employee, um, that technically or like an independent contractor, you would not have that FMLA guaranteed to you. Um, it might be more of a sort of something you'd work out with your employer if they potentially be able to offer that, but it would not be something that's mandated. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on the type of practice you're working for, like a really small, you know, one doctor place, they might not be able to afford that to someone that's, you know, uh, doing a 1099 work for the most part, independent contracting. Mm -hmm. So it can be a little bit different. Um, I was fairly fortunate. Ours was, you know, I took the 12 weeks of maternity leave. Um, they actually offered um, partial pay for the first six weeks. Mm -hmm. And then I also substituted the additional rest of the pay with something called short-term disability. And so that's something that a lot of people don't know about. Um, at least here you should sign up for, if you're thinking about having kids, you know, you can sign up for it. You have to sign up for it before you're pregnant, um, because it's kind of like a pre-existing condition. Mm -hmm. So I actually signed up basically a year before we got pregnant. So I had that and you pay each month a little bit, but it does add up over mm -hmm. those, you know, six weeks, they pay for about six weeks, at least the one that I signed up with. So that mm -hmm. helps with some of the pay while you're out together, mine ended up being about hundred percent of my normal pay. And then the second six weeks is essentially when I'm using my sick time, my vacation time, things like that through my work, which is mandated. So I do still get paid, but I'm also using up that time, which is sort of a trade-off. Wow. Yeah. It gets very complicated. I feel when you have the different types of jobs, the different, like the independent contract versus being an employee and 12 weeks is so short. I think every Canadian has heard that about us mat leave. And we're just I like, what is it in Canada? I actually don't know. I think 40 weeks. So like mm -hmm. almost a year pretty much. Wow. Yeah. But I don't know, <laughs> but I don't think we get like, so I was just talking to my friend about this the other day because mm -hmm. she just had her baby nine months ago. And, um, she said it's not, so if you take a year off in Canada, you don't always get the full pay. It's like oh, a little yes. bit less. If yeah. you take a shorter amount, then you might get full pay, but it's not the full amount of pay. If you take the whole year Yeah. or I think ours is, could be even up to 18 months 
I believe. Wow. That's, That's what awesome. I was told. Yes. Yeah. Should move to Canada. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I think, I think one thing that I would definitely say, no matter what your setup is, um, if you're an employee, there's going to be some kind of HR resource for you. And so make sure that mm. even as a woman, if you're not, you know, thinking about having a kid anytime soon, it's still important to know what your employer's policy is, um, because it's not like it's something that's never happened before. You know, no one's ever had a kid here. Like that's probably not going to happen. And so yeah. There is a policy in place. It's important to know that. And then hopefully there's someone that can help to kind of read between the lines. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I was on the phone with HR a lot to help me just make sure I knew exactly what to expect. Um, and then also if you have other, you know, colleagues that have kind of gone through the process, that's what is really helpful too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so let's say aside from maternity or paternity leave, if you're planning for a family what other health benefits are really important to take into consideration as an optometrist when you're planning? There's probably a lot of different things. One thing that's probably a more um, immediate concern would be the childcare, you know, if you're going back to work. So is, you know, does your employer help with any of that? Does, you know, government help with any of that here? They don't, you're kind of just like on your own. Um, and so finding out something that works for you. So location in the house, making sure it's a place that's safe, that you trust. Um, so that's a big one. That's a huge mm -hmm. one. And it was here, at least it's like the second you find out you're pregnant, you know, or, you know, it's viable, the, the pregnancy, even if, you know, no matter what happens, it's still a good idea to start looking for childcare early because a lot oh of places gosh. and what you hear from friends is like, we started looking, you know, we just went out pregnant, you know, we're at maybe week six or something like that of pregnancy. And we're already on the wait list for next yes. year. So getting childcare is hard. And we just found out for ours, I pretty much called, like, I think I was eight weeks pregnant and they were like, oh, we can't guarantee a spot. And it wasn't until about three weeks ago that they're like, okay, a spot opened up. And I was like, oh my gosh. Oh my so, God. Uh, but cool. it's like it's does that. And so we got on the wait list for a couple different places. We had our preferences, um, but at least making sure you have something when you go back, it's not something you want to wait on. Another thing, at least here, you know, especially with your employer, they might have some sort of, you know, HSA or FSA, some kind of health savings account that you can use or something that you can use to um, maybe uh, they used here they call it, I think a child care credit or something, but there's different mm -hmm. ways that they can maybe offer money that's pre-tax to come out and go to a special account that can be used to care for family members. So it could be for child care, um, could be for elderly care in some places. So that's another thing you can think about, um, just ways to save a little bit of money on, on those things. Yeah. You're not the only person who's brought up stories like that. The wait lists. The oh yeah. Not even just daycare. I mean, I've had a cousin who was pregnant trying to sign up her child for preschool, like yeah. four years in advance. I'm not lying. This is a real story. And she was on a wait list. And I was like, this is not something that I think needs to stress you out during your pregnancy. Right. Right. But it's unfortunately like, that's the reality. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's insane. So now is your daughter like, mm -hmm. is she like locked in and ready to go for daycare when she's old enough? She is, she is. So wow. yeah, she'll pretty much just go back when I go back to work. Um, we're, we're all set. So oh, that's good. That's like huge weight off your shoulders when it kind of lines up and you get like a spot, you're like, Oh, okay. I can breathe now. Like I can go back oh to gosh. work and not be like, what am I going to do with her? So Allison, I think this is a really important question that goes really like deep surface level um, or under the surface. Um, how important are the support systems in this stage of your life? And what advice would you give to other new parents that may not have this type of a support system to rely on? That is a really great question. Um and I think that it obviously is going to be different for everybody for a couple of reasons. Number one, not everybody has, you know, family nearby or good friends nearby that can help and, you know, jump in if your child is sick or something. And then the other thing is, I think people need different things. So some people need more, you know, emotional support because raising a child is hard, especially at the beginning, you're 
you know, hormones are kind of all over the place and you think you're doing a terrible job sometimes. And then sometimes you think you're like the most awesome ever. And it can vary in the matter of like an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like a lot that goes through, you know, your mind. And so, you know, for us, I can speak to, to my experience. I had my parents come, um, you know, the first week that she was born and that was super helpful to have my mom there with me. Uh, they left and then my husband's parents came and it was, again, they were awesome, helpful, things like that. But my parents live in Missouri and his parents live in California. And so mm. we don't have family nearby. Um, and so would I love to have that kind of network? Absolutely. Um, but we just don't have it. And, you know, as far as friends, of course, we have wonderful friends here, but we're not like, hey, can you, you know, come watch our sick kid because they all yeah. have careers they're working and yeah. it's not their kid. So you know, <laughs> having that support network in terms of friendships is awesome, but it's not going to help with childcare. So that's something that, you know, from our standpoint right now, we're probably going to have a little bit of a tough time navigating that. So mm -hmm. I, I do think that support networks are amazing if you can have them, but they're not mandatory. And so I wouldn't say that should be your, you know, a factor that holds you back. If you're thinking about starting a family, I think people make it work. Um, you know, for example, our hospital has something that they sort of offer like, Hey, you know, there's this network of people that are vetted, you know, through some of our mm -hmm. childcare facilities. And if you have a kid that, you know, can't go to childcare, but you need to go to work, you know, you can go through this link or these resources and oh, um, okay. get, you know, kind of emergency childcare for a day or two, you know, here and there. So that's kind of a unique one, but there are other services or just finding a way to, you know, discuss with your employer. Hopefully there's some flexibility. Hey, if I need to stay home, what do I do? You know, what, what yeah. happens? Um, and I think that, you know, for my husband and I, we have different um, administration days. And so we both have different administrative duties um, and our days are different. So if I need to, I can work from home on my admin day when I'm doing a lot of yeah. stuff on the computer. You know, if she gets sick on a Monday, I might be in luck, right? <laughs> but other days, you know, hopefully my, my, you know, I'm telehealth some days, so it might be a little bit easier to stay at home, even though they're pretty busy days um, or things like that. But I think people make it work. I guess maybe ask me that question in like three months. <laughs> I'll, I'll know. Um, I'll have maybe more insight into how it worked, but yeah. I think people figure it out when they, when they need to, you know? Yeah. I think when you like when you brought up the childcare and daycare, I think it's important if if you know that there aren't that many family members that live near you, if all of your friends are also not in that same, you know, point in their life where they are having kids and you know they're still out traveling all the time, you know, no responsibilities, living their life free, mm -hmm. you can also then mentally start planning okay, I'm probably going to have to be that person that, that needs daycare and needs childcare. Mm -hmm. Let's open up the piggy bank and, you know, start saving for that and signing up and planning for that. So, you know, we're fortunate. I'm fortunate. I live 20 minutes away from my parents and my in-laws. They are all ready to take early retirement once <laughs> the first grandchild pops out. Oh my God, that's amazing. Because they, <laughs> right? They are all ready. They're like, we're only alive now to see grandkids. So. <laughs> yeah, <it'll come laughs> Nothing else in life. So you know, we're <laughs> fortunate enough where we know, you know, anytime a child enters our life, we have plenty of people around to, to pitch in and, you know, help raise our kids together. But I, yeah, like you said, there's so many people that probably already know they, they don't have access to that on an everyday basis. So then plan ahead, plan mm -hmm. early. And yeah, I feel like the pieces always fall into place. You always make it work. You can always mm -hmm. adjust your schedule too. Like you said, talking to the employers is going to be really important when you're planning to go back. And I just had one other question to add on then, because I'm curious now. So you are still home. You're still on your mat leave. Um, are you planning to change anything when you do go back to, you know, your work schedule? Cause you're doing so many things, um, in your career. Are there any parts of your career that you might step back from something that you might want to change? Yeah, I think, I think it becomes, you know, kind of like a good magnifying glass and to look at, you know, your life and what you're spending your time doing. So for me, I had to, you know, I've already done this a little bit within the last few months is I've kind of gone through, you know, 
things that I'm involved in, different editorial boards, things. I have a column for review of optometry mm -hmm. um, and I'm involved in doing a lot of lecturing, things like that. Um, so early on, I decided, hey, you know what? I'm not going to do any lecturing engagements where I fly somewhere until she's at least six months old. Mm -hmm. So that was like my hard and fast cutoff. Um, so I made that rule just to at least have something. And then I always said, you know, if I want to go longer than that, I can later, mm -hmm. but at least I had that. I also, you know, took a step back from um, being on the editorial board for a, for a group that does amazing, great things in optometry, but I'm just like, for me, I felt like I didn't have the time to devote to it that I mm -hmm. said that I would. And I know going forward, it's just going to get busier. Um, so I did already kind of step back from a few things um, that I felt like maybe weren't on the top of my priority list in the career space. So yeah. there's always that balancing act. And the thing is, you know, you might, I might have this figured out for me for now, for the next six months or a year, but there's always going to be new opportunities that come up um, and then things that you might have to let go. And so I think deciding what seems right for you kind of in that moment um, and thinking ahead, maybe in the next year or less, it's helpful in some ways because you can decide what you have time for because ultimately your your family will come first, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and you always, always have to remember that they're little for such a short period of time and they grow up so quickly that you don't want to miss those things because you felt like you were working too hard. Um, yeah. At least that's how I think of it. No, I think you're right. Like a baby really does put things into perspective. And I think that's a thing that a lot of people don't think about. They just still want to take everything on after because they feel like they might not get those opportunities later. But like you said, those opportunities will always still come. You just mm -hmm. have to wait for them. But you really do have to prioritize what's important. And, you know, you're right. Your family will always come first. So you can't yeah. just spread yourself too thin. And then face burnout and all that other fun mental health stuff. <laughs> Good I vibes like, only, right? <laughs> yeah. I was listening to um, a podcast. I can't remember which one it was at this point, but they were basically talking about how we say yes to a lot of things, especially as women. We're a lot more prone to not only say yes to different things because we feel like, you know, A, it's kind of an ego boost that someone asks you to like, mm -hmm. oh, no, yeah. it's an honor to do this thing. Yeah. But also, you know, we feel like we might do a really good job at it. And it's kind of a, you know, a pride thing and you want to help people. And so yeah. we not only say yes more, but we also get asked more than men, especially mm -hmm. for what did they call it? Like a non-career building thing where it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. impact like your finances or it's not necessarily a career builder. It's just something to do to help out your employer or your organization, but you don't get credit for it essentially. Oh, and so wow. it, was, yeah. it was very interesting. Non-promotable task oh. is, is what they called it. Non-promotable task. Non-promotable hmm. task. And that was from um, one called best of both worlds, but best of both worlds. Okay. That's yeah. the podcast. That's name. the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. But it was really interesting. I'm like, I feel like we do say yes to a lot of those things. Um, and there was one person was talking about like a moment where it kind of dawned on her and she was like, you know, going meeting to meeting to meeting. And she was super busy that day. And she kept like running past her coworker who was happened to be a male, not saying it's always like that. Um, but she was like, I've literally been going meeting to meeting to meeting. We have the same job. We get paid either the same month. You probably get paid more than her, honestly. Yeah. And yet they're, you know, she's working her butt off and he's been in the same spot, you know, really thinking about yeah. things, having time to do stuff. Yeah. Um, they were in, I think in research. And so he was, you know, pondering all these deep research questions that they have and she's just like busy and yeah. so that's one thing that we need to be better at as you know as mm -hmm. women is saying no to things and you know taking the time to put towards things that elevate our profession elevate us in our career yeah. you know and yeah and also don't forget no is a full sentence you can literally yeah. say no and then leave it at that <laughs> yeah yeah the Canadians so. might say no thank you but uh <laughs> And, and honestly, Allison, like you're so right. I think Deep One and I, all of our listeners probably, they should know us by now. Deep One <laughs> and I learned how to say no very quickly. And we are the, we are the no women. <laughs> like we say no to like everything now. Cause we're so burned out anyway. Nope, 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 nope. Don't want to do this. 
Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So we're getting to the end of our podcast here, Allison. But any other advice you would like to share for all the optometrists that are doing their best to balance (laughs) um, work and family life? I think that is the perfect way to put it is doing your best. You know, Mm -hmm. I remember growing up, my mom said it doesn't matter how, you know, if you get an A on this, it's just do your best. But Mm -hmm. that translates to our whole life. Right. And Mm -hmm you know, your best, some days you're going to be able to give hundred percent and some days you're going to be able to give 70. And Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us, you know, come into, you know, you go through your undergrad, you go through, you know, optometry school, you you know, we're kind of perfectionists. A lot of us are not all of us, but you always expected to have things perfectly set planned out, but it doesn't always work out that way. So give yourself grace, um, on the days that are tough. And I think there's never a perfect balance between, the work and the life and the family and the work and things like that. Um, and it's constantly changing. And so mm-hmm. yeah, that's really it. I don't, mm-hmm. I feel like I don't have any advice besides uh, do your best, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that was perfectly, perfectly said mm-hmm. and the perfect way to end the conversation. So thank you so much uh, again, Allison, for coming on. We're so mm-hmm. happy that you were open enough to share your journey and your experiences now being a mom Good luck going back to work. Thank Keep you. us updated with how you yeah. feel and what you've been going through. We can always do um, a part two to see maybe what's changed after a few months that you've gone back. Because I'm sure a lot of people will be curious to know mm-hmm. everything that you said today. How relevant is it, you know, six months down the road? Or right. did you just quit optometry? 100% and you're like I'm, I'm a stay-at-home mom I know what? can you imagine she's like I'm a stay-at-home mom now everything I said in that podcast I, is not true. you <laughs> know what I love my daughter so much but I yeah. have to stay at home with her all the time <laughs> yeah it drive you nuts and, and surprisingly yeah. I feel like a lot of women don't they say they would never be a stay-at-home mom but then once they have kids they start yeah. converting like yeah. they just fall in love so yeah, much that they're right. like yeah. So, so we'll see what happens to you in six months. We'll make yeah. a bet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's, we'll make a bet. We'll make it offline and then we'll see what happens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening to four eyes. The podcast series brought to you by young OD connect. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Instagram or YouTube at four eyes optom for more content. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.